Join me and my guest, Dr. Steve Gable, as we discuss In the Heart of the Sea, The Tragedy of the Whale Ship Essex by Nathaniel Philbrick. The experience of the ship Essex was the model of Herman Melville's Moby Dick. Today, a Nantucket boiled dinner and much more on Dinner and a Book. Nastrovia. The whaling ship Essex was an American ship from Nantucket, Massachusetts. She was attacked and sunk by a sperm whale in the Pacific Ocean in 1820, 2,000 nautical miles off the west coast of South America. The 20 sailors set out in three smaller whale boats with not enough food supplies and very little fresh water. The incident was an inspiration for Herman Melville's 1851 classic novel, Moby Dick. Let's find out how this event happened and what happened in the very end with my guest, Dr. Steve Gable, as we prepare a Nantucket boiled dinner with baked beans, brown bread, and maybe even a gin and tonic. Dinner and a Book is made possible by a generous grant from the Rex and Alice A. Martin Foundation. Welcome, it's good to have you here. Well, it's very nice to be here. I'm... You're doing some chopping here for our New England boiled meal. Safely even. Safely, <laughs> you haven't lost any fingers. I'm so glad. <laughs> I have been cooking some boiled beef here, some brisket for four hours. And we've got a nice juice in here. I've added peppercorns, I've had cloves, I have a, a bay leaf. And we are going to take what you are chopping up and put it in here. We have red potatoes. We have cabbage. I will add some sliced uh, turnips and some carrots. And we will be cooking this throughout the show. I'm going to add some a little bit later here. Turnips. Now that is an interesting uh, addition. Not too many people cook with turnips, but they certainly did on Nantucket. Uh, Steve, let's just talk a little bit about Nantucket as the setting for our book, This Whaling Ship Essex, a true story. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Um, Nantucket is, I think, a, a Wapanag word, an Indian word for a faraway island, right? Yeah, faraway land. Faraway land. Well, Quakers, not the Quakers, but the English came in around, so, 1660. Around in that time. Yes, and they settled the island. They were growing their own vegetables and fruits, raising lamb and cattle. And after about 30 years, something had to change. And they were unable to sustain yes. themselves on that island because it's not very, the, the, the soil wasn't good. There weren't very many trees. Right. This was not going to be a very uh, good enterprise for them. So what do they do? They go to the mainland. And they persuade Mr. Ichabod. Yeah, Ichabod Pollock to come. They'd, they noticed, since it's an island surrounded by the sea, that there were hundreds of right whales right. Uh, right. Off, off the coast. And so they thought, well, we can't sustain ourselves with the, with the farming, so we've, we're going to have to turn to the sea. And so they decided, and the Wapanoak Indians had tried to get whaling. So they went to the mainland where they were already doing whaling out of Cape Cod brought back Ichapod Pollock to teach them how to, you know, how to do whaling, and the rest, as they say, is history. Well, you know, and it says they, he was brought in to kill animals. Yes. I mean, it was very, very direct as, as far as what they needed to do. So, you see these Nantucketers, I mm -hmm. guess you can call them, they're sitting along the beach and they're watching the man going out and killing the whales. They could see it right from the shore. Yes, all the whaling was done out of port out into the water nearby, kill the whales, drag them back. Drag them back and then of course boil the oil and uh, I mean there was such a process in, mm -hmm. in doing. Yeah, they have dressing. to take the blubber and boil the blubber down, get the oil and put it in casks and yes. you know, sell it back to the mainland. 
Well, they're doing this, and they it, this is almost like, let's take a picnic and go watch them kill That's a whale. Right. I mean, it was so <laughs> interesting. And um, we had Wampanoag, I call them Wampanoags, you call them... You said Wampanoags something. or... All right, something like that. What? You know, it's like tomato, The Native tomato. Americans. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right, the Native <laughs> Americans. Uh, well, and of course, then they fish out the whales, and they have to move to other areas. Yes. So what happens when they go looking for the sperm whales? I mean, they just have to be gone a long time. Well, there was an incident that was listed in the book where one guy is out to get right whales, a storm comes up, blows him out further into sea, and he, after the storm is over, he sees a bigger whale, kills it, and, bring, and brings it back, and they find out that it's a sperm whale. And, and the they found out there was much, uh, yes. much uh, more oil. You know, much more oil and the spermacetti, which is where, which is a big tank in the whales in the sperm whale's head, filled with hundreds of gallons of of this almost pure oil. Pure oil, and of course, this is the oil that everybody wants. It is, you know, it. They don't have gas. They don't have oil. They have sperm oil. That's right. And it's an interesting process. So, what happens in the island during this time? We're we're, we're watching our our. Uh, boiling uh, taking place mm -hmm. here and just before we move on to the next I'm going to do some uh, Boston baked beans and I actually called the New Bedford Whaling Museum well after they were no longer making um, uh, they were no longer raising lamb or beef they would have fish and they had a lot of baked beans so I have baked beans with molasses I've got some pork I put some bacon in here and we're going to put it in the oven to accompany our meal, we've got our brisket going, and we're going to let that uh, cook a little bit. I'm going to put in a few more potatoes here. We've got lots of cabbage, haven't we? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a beautiful a... head of cabbage. So we'll just stir that a little bit. All right, so now they find out they have to go further and further away from Nantucket because the sperm whales are not swimming around Nantucket. So where do they end up going? Well, they find, they go out into the Atlantic and as, and two things happen. They find out, one, that there are richer pods, pods. Of, of sperm whale in the Pacific Ocean, right. plus they overfish the Atlantic. Not only do they overfish around the island, they overfish the Atlantic. So it was then the long trek, 17,000 miles down right. the in the entire Atlantic, around the Cape of Good Hope and into the Pacific Ocean. So these men are gone for two and three years at a time. That's correct. And they have to they have to bring in a certain number of whales. I mean, the goal is to make money. Yes. So they're That's gone. Funny. So what, uh, uh, before we talk about who's actually, you know, kind of running the island, uh -huh. so the women, many of the women then take over and they start running the farms. They, they're having their own little businesses. Yeah, I, I think that represents two things. One is the absence of the men, so right. the women had to take over. But number two, many of the people who came to Nantucket early were Quakers. And the Quakers were known to have equality of women. That was one of yes. the things, well, it was one of the, not tenets or isms of the religion, but that's how everyone was treated. All the people were considered to be equal, so the women were empowered by the religion, therefore by the community, which was Quaker, and therefore also by the absence of the men. So it was a huge matriarchal society. Probably one of the first areas in the country where women were taking care of business, running the shops, and uh, as you said, all the men were not gone all the time, but the women had this responsibility. Uh, and then the men would come back and hopefully they had made their catch after this three years of traveling. Mm -hmm. uh, if they didn't, they didn't make as much money. Um, and this is a Quaker society that believed in working hard. They made lots of money. Yes, they did. And they it was a very lucrative business if a, if the boat was successful. If it were yes, if it were successful. So and you had this sort of idea too that God must have planned this for the Quakers to be the head of the whaling industry. And I'm just checking here to make sure this is boiling and everything's cooking. You know, I wanted to see a little bit of Moby Dick, so I got the movie. I didn't get a chance to read the book. I looked at the movie, uh -huh. and I'm seeing Gregory Peck as the Quaker. He's the, you know, he is um, the captain, Ahab, and he's the and now. I know he had to be a Quaker. Of course, you're an expert on Moby Dick. Yes. And uh, would you as assume that that's the situation? Well, I would assume, I mean, the owners of the ships were all always Quakers. 
And you would imagine that since Quakerism was took over the island, that almost everybody on the island, even not the boat owners, but captains and the and the and the ship's crew were almost always Quakers. Congregationalists right. were also on the island, but they were, didn't quite have the uh, the in the inner uh, grouping as the Quakers did. Well, and how did the Quakers get there? Well, people said leave Massachusetts. Yeah, they were. They, they were weren't. considered maybe not. They were different and. They considered mm -hmm. them, what, unusual. They didn't fit in. Let's get them off out but, of the mainland and go to Well, Nantucket. many years before that, you could be hanged if you, you know, in Massachusetts, if you were a Quaker or not a member of the Puritan church. And yes. so England stepped in and stopped the hangings, but, they, but the Quakers were not welcome. And so they went to their own place, Nantucket. Nantucket. And, and then they used Nantucket or what Nantucket offered them uh, to, to sustain themselves. It's a fascinating, when you think about this uh, and the history of Nantucket Island, uh, all right, so we're talking about the whale ship Essex. It's going to, it, it has a certain number of people in the crew, Owen mm -hmm. Chase, George Pollard, who's the captain, and the young lad, what was his name? Thomas Nickerson, Thomas the Nickerson. cabin boy, 15 years old. Yes, and some of these are Nantucketers, some of these well, some are, and of course, what's the what's the uh, class system here on the whale ship? Well, first of all, the, the most objective is the the captain and officers, and then the crew. But, but they in are, there are sublayers. But then they're Nantucketers. That's Remember right. Remember, we talked about this. If you had to get more whalers, you would get them from off the island, off islanders. Yes. And there was a pecking order. And so, so the top of the the cream were the Nantucketers. Yes. So if you were a native Nantucketer, but then you had to be from the certain, even there there was a stratum uh -huh. of who was from the original families right. with names like Starbuck and Coffin and, and Folger Ma and, and Macy. Macy. These names all ring a bell, don't they? Yeah, well, <laughs> Absolutely. There, was a, there was a gentleman later on by the name of Macy who went to New York City and founded Macy's. Absolutely, it and started the, all here, I think, a lot. Yes, and the, the Starbuck brand of coffee is named after the fictitious first mate of the Pequod in Moby Dick, Starbuck, which was an old name originally from Nantucket. Uh, we're going to take a break. We want you to take a look at some scenes, some pictures of Owen Chase, and uh, then we're going to come back and tell you about this 92-foot killer whale. We'll be right back. Steve Gable and I are discussing in the heart of the sea <laughs> the tragedy of the whale ship Essex by Nathaniel Philbrick and working on our New England dinner and you are doing what here? I am cutting up the New England brown bread, has raisins in it, yes. and putting it into slices uh, to enjoy with the meal. Absolutely. You know, another hint we had was brown bread, beans. So while you're slicing, I'm going to get the beans. I think they're ready. They have molasses, they have a little bacon. Good. Brown sugar. And we will have yeah. them cooling here. So every meal, every New England meal, well, practically ever had beans. So here we are. Uh, we're working on our New England boil, and mm -hmm. I'm going to take this lid off and get some of the meat out here so that it can sort of settle. This is the brisket, and we're cooking uh, potatoes, cabbage, carrots, and turnips, and I'm really going to turn it down low now. Um, now, yeah, that's we're talking about there. getting this t this crew ready. They're going to go out and sail. They're going to look for sperm whale, and what happens to them? What happens to them on the west coast of South America? Well, they sail all the way around, you know, the the Cape of Good Hope and out into the Pacific. Yes. They're heading for a new whaling ground that. Had recently been discovered about 2,000 miles west of there. Yes. And so they see spouts, they lower the three whale boats. They had more, but some of them were damaged in storms in the Atlantic, etc. So they only had three left, so they take these boats out to chase the whales. And while this is happening, they leave two or three men back on the boat, and one of the, the bull sperm whale, which they said was probably 
almost 90 feet in length. Can you imagine? Rams the boat. Yes, and so, rams it again. Yeah, it hits it the first time, and then it sort of rolls over on its side as if it's knocked itself out, and then it comes around and hits it right from the bow, again, going you know several miles per hour, and makes a hole in the front of the boat and the boat sinks. The boat sinks. Here are these three whale ships, 20 men. They have some provisions, not enough. They think they're going to go to an island that's close by, find out they're cannibals and say, oh, we can't go there. We're going to sail until we, well, with all well, the winds and having to go down and up yeah, and, that and down. Was their, and that was their, really their first big mistake. Yes. I mean, they should have gone to the island. They should have gone to the islands. But here they are, almost like an appointment in Samara, they say we're not going to the islands, which is downwind and downstream from where they are. They're going to go upwind and upstream 2,000 miles because they're afraid of cannibals. And then yeah. here they are later on having to revert to, to exactly cannibalism well, we in could, the boats. We could call this second part starvation, death, and cannibalism because That's what happens title. is it is, and you know, <laughs> that led us to all kinds of things like rib roast and and uh, what else? Corn, well, for right now we're having corn, head, we're having head of cabbage head of and cabbage. I mean, toes. you uh. really, really, you know, let your imagination go. But these men are three months, ninety days in these ships, and it does come to the point where salt water you can't drink salt water, and they are becoming so ill they have no food left, so they do resort to shooting their their shipmates, right? Yes, the first. The first couple who expire or die because of starvation, they give burial at sea. Yes. Then they begin to see with rations that have dwindled to a half a pint of water and yes. one and a half ounces so of hard tack a enough. day. They say, well, what are we doing here? And so the people that naturally expired from dehydration or from uh, starvation, they then ate. They ate them, yes. And when and they ran out of the, the people who were naturally there's that horrific scene where they actually draw lots, and, and the man who brought up drawing lots drew the black spot. And so they... And then they draw lots again to see who has to shoot kill him. And kill him. And they shot him in the head. It, the, the details are, are incredible and riveting. This is not an adventure story, is it? It's, no. a, it's a tragedy. It, it's aptly named the tragedy of the whale ship Essex. Absolutely. You and get the history, you get the adventure, but over it is this terrible pall of oh. these desperate men, and it's because they went the wrong way. Instead of going to mm. the... Uh, the islands where they were afraid yeah, they were cannibals. The Society Islands, which includes Tahiti, where there was a big English settlement already there. Right. Uh, you know, they said, no, we can't go there because we're afraid of cannibals. So then they're forced into cannibalism on their way, Absolutely. trying to get back to Absolutely, and South three America. months later, they are discovered. One ship is discovered, and uh, you're a doctor. Tell us what the effects of this starvation on the remaining men. What did they find? They were disoriented. Did they well, even know who they were? No, they found they found the captain and one, another member of the crew in one of the lifeboats, yes. uh, whale boats. They weren't lifeboats, they were whale boats. Uh, and a ship just passing by found them. Found when them. they found them, they were the two men were lying on the bottom of the boat, completely disoriented, hoarding the bones uh -huh. of their ex-shipmates. Absolutely, and they were so disoriented they didn't even know they had been discovered. I mean, starvation, well, you know, your body's eating your body. And, yes. and, and they were, it took them so long to recuperate, the ones that were re remaining. But, you know, this whole thing was, you know, the, sh the ship never came back. These three men, of course, it sunk. Three uh -huh. men are back, maybe a few more. And George Pollard, who was the captain, yeah. he sent out on another mission, and he <laughs> has bad luck again. Not that, quite this bad, but almost. Well, he, he gets back. I mean, you would think a more, maybe a more reasonable person would never go back out to sea again, but the survivors all went back to sea. They all went back, and, you know, they wrote their stories. Owen Chase, Wilkerson wrote what happened. Herman Melville gets a hold of some of these notes. Yes, he, and when, you know, when Melville is at sea on a whaler, he meets Owen Chase's son who has the manuscript or the, or the account yes, from Owen Chase, from the, the mate, from the Essex. And it's grounded in fact that this could happen 
and it did happen with the Essex, and then it was novelized. It's a uh, it's a tragedy, and of course George Pollard, he ends up as a night watchman. Yes. You can you can go to Nantucket today and see the homes of Chase, of um, Pollard, and a few others that are still original. Yes, Nickerson's home is still there too. Yes, and so, so I'm going to go back to Nantucket and see this yeah. now that I've read this book. So you know. You have stories of leadership. There were mistakes made, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. The captain, Pollard, was not strong enough with his men. Yes. They convinced him to change his mind. He should have stayed with it. Yeah, because his original plan was to go to the islands. And they could have gotten there in 30 days. The way they worked it out but, was they, they thought they could make South America in 60 days, which obviously they never got back to South America in 90 days. They were rescued at sea, two of the boats. The third boat was never found. And you know, this was a tragedy because this is the identity of these men, the Islanders, the Quakers. And you know, Nantucket then, whaling industry yeah. disappeared. You had, you said, I think 70,000 men involved or how many ships in the whole whaling industry at well, the time? Nantucket at its time had 150 whaling ships sailing out of just that port. There were probably yeah, 500 This in was the life of the, um, yeah. of, of, it was the center of the whaling industry in the world. So what happens when there's no longer whaling, somebody discovers oil in Pennsylvania? Yeah, there was right? a whole, whole series of events that ended Nantucket's 40-year dominance of whaling. But we don't give up on Nantucket. Where do many people go from the East Coast That's for right. their holidays? <laughs> Nantucket. It they, is a center for the resort industry. Yes. And talking about resort industry, you know, when you go there, one of the favorite drinks is? Gin and tonic. And we have to investigate this further, I think, <laughs> don't you? Well, yes, and I think that uh, not only because it is a symbol of the rebirth of Nantucket, but it's also, as a physician, purely for medicinal reasons that we drink this. Uh, Absolutely, I we mean. Have, we have our lime, which will prevent scurvy, and which was yes. required by the English Navy, hence yeah. limeys for English sailors, and we have our tonic water, which is quinine, which will keep us from getting malaria. I'm so, so glad we're protected. Oh, absolutely. But I, I mean, th doctor, I think you should get on with, uh, taste is with this, don't you? Yes, taste is only a byproduct of this medicine. Absolutely, and I just, I'm, I'm fascinated. That's where limeys came from, and we're having a lime with our gin and tonic. We're preventing any occurrence of scurvy or malaria. Absolutely, and right right here in South Bend, those two scourges are now being prevented as you watch. And held at bay, I do want you to know. <laughs> uh, we are gathering up some of our final preparations here. I have uh, prepared a bowl of strawberries because they would have served fruit for dessert. Mm -hmm. We'll have it with some cream. I have the brisket sort of setting here and we're going to carve it the way it should be. We'll add our cabbage, potatoes, carrots, and turnips. Adjust the uh, spices. We have our brown bread. Simple meal. A delicious meal, and I think you should go right ahead. Don't let yes. me hold you back. Okay, and we're using Indiana gin. Uh, yes, shop so. locally, right? That's right. We're being green. And um, I, so I have to gin. recommend this book highly. It's really, really very effective. Well, it has everything. It, it sets the scene of a of kind of a, a part of Americana uh, that really uh, was important. It led from a transition from kind of the way we used to do things and the way we looked at ecology and overfishing to now our ecology now. Yes. It introduces the need for oil also for an industrial basis, but then supplanted by finding oil in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania. Plus, uh, it gives us a great history of the people uh, and of a whaling industry. Highly recommend it. Plus, there's a little bit of adventure and there's a little bit of horror in there as well. So There is, definitely. So for every appetite, there's something for everyone. Including the New England to... Nantucket dinner appetite. Yes. Uh, and so it. you're going to squeeze a little. Uh, oh, you yes, already I, did. No, the, no. What I'm are you going to yet. do now? All right. So, this is the this is the way you do it on Nantucket Island. And and actually, gin and tonic, Cape Cod. It seems to be the drink. Doesn't yes. It? And rightly so. I mean, because you've got when you're in an island, you need to make sure that you're not catching these. These. Awful diseases. You know, we're going to be setting up our, our table, our preparation here, and uh, we're going to come back and have a toast, toast to the Islanders. And so stay with us.
we do want you to join us for dinner. <laughs> we'll be right back. Yes. And we were just looking at some of the remaining homes of some of the people from the crew, and we've just seen yes. those shots. Captain Pollard and Owen Chase, the first mate, and the little cabin boy, Thomas Nickerson. Their houses still yes, exist. Yes, they're still there. You can visit them. You know, our food today has been a New England boiled dinner mm -hmm. with carrots, turnip, potatoes, yeah. and cabbage. And then we have uh, Boston baked beans, and then you cut slices of, of the Boston brown bread. Boston brown bed, and bread, and then we have strawberries. Strawberries and green right from the island. Yes. And that's our kind of typical meal. Uh, we've read the book again, In the Heart of the Sea, The Tragedy of the Whale mm -hmm. Ship Essex. The author is uh, Nathaniel Philbrick. Oh. And you, had you read, you hadn't read this book before, had you? I had you? not read the book before, no. I had what heard of the book, but I'm so glad that I read it and I find it excellent because my favorite book is Moby Dick and this sets the framework, the foundation, the skeleton, if you will. Yes. Of Moby Dick. So it really can happen that a boat can be stove by a whale and it gives you the background so that you can understand Moby Dick of the Quakers, of Nantucket, Absolutely. and of the history of the whaling. Absolutely. Great book. Read this first, then Absolutely. read Moby Dick. And I think we ought to have a toast. And what is your preferred toast for the situation in the moment? Well, I think the traditional Nantucket whalers toast should be uh, given here. And All that right. is, death to the living, long live the killers success to sailors wives and greasy luck to whalers oh my goodness let's toast that i guess there you, there that you was the typical toast and it's a great drink isn't it it's delicious it is delicious yes. and we feel better for it and i do want to thank you for joining me steve it's it been absolutely pleasure. my pleasure Good. I, I got to talk about a great book i'm looking forward to a great dinner a great gin and tonic and a great hostess. Thank you Thank very, you so much. very much. And remember, good food, good <laughs> friends, and good books make for a very good life. See you next time. Dinner and a Book is made possible by a generous grant from the Rex and Alice A. Martin Foundation.